and uh, it is a privilege to be here. Uh, truly, uh, truly a privilege. And uh, Pastor Ludka asked me a few months ago now, and uh, been been praying and asking the Lord to to give me exactly what uh, what we need to hear. And I pray over the next couple of days. Uh, you'll be able to look beyond me, beyond anything I say to the Word of God, because that's really what we're going to walk away with that's going to help us in our lives. And uh, before I jump into this tonight, I, first of all, I just want to say publicly thank you to, to Pastor Ludka. And uh, as, as I have only got to know him, know him over the last couple of months, uh, I can tell you this, our pastor speaks very, very highly of him. And, uh, and what I know for sure is that you have a faithful pastor. And, uh, and men, I, I tell you, be thankful for that. It's not everywhere you have a pastor that's been there 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years. And for Pastor Ludka to be here, faithfully be growing this church and faithfully loving you and your family, um, that's special. That's special. And I tell you, being an assistant pastor now and being much closer to a pastor than I've ever been before, I could tell you that the, the burdens and the, the burden they have for you, they, they carry all the time. It's not an eight to five thing. Uh, I know, I know my own pastor. Just watching his conversation and what he's thinking about and the questions he's asking, he's always thinking about his people. And so, uh, can I just encourage you, men of the church, to be an encouragement to him? You keep praying for this man. You keep being faithful to him. Be a blessing to his family. Um, and uh, and just uh, thank you for that, pastor. And I, I think I, I think Pastor Ludka for being a friend to our pastor. Um, I, you know, not everybody was real excited for what, different reasons or whatever else that a new pastor was coming into the area and planting a church or replanting a church. And I tell you, Pastor Ludko is one of the men that got behind Pastor and encouraged him along the way. And uh, Pastor has valued that greatly. Our pastor, Pastor Schmidt. Um, and then I just want to thank him for this opportunity. Uh, there are a lot of men. Uh, more qualified, been alive longer, kids down the road, all those things that uh, that could be preaching tonight. And uh, yet he uh, is kind enough to give a young guy uh, an opportunity to let God work uh, through him. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. And so just wanted to say that. I want to say, who, who made the jambal jambalaya tonight? Uh, who made that? Okay, that was made with magic, sir. That stuff was amazing. Thank you for that. And, and to all the men who cooked tonight and uh, over the next couple of days, thank you for that. Uh, as Pastor mentioned, I'm originally from California. I, uh, I was working down in Macon, Georgia as a children's pastor uh, to a, a larger church and had a big children's ministry and everything was really, really comfortable. And uh, as I began to uh, just, as I was jumping in God's word and hearing messages, all of a sudden it stood out to me that there was nothing in my life that was by faith. I wasn't doing anything in my life that was a step of faith or showing any level of trust in God. And here God was blessing me and my life was comfortable and things were good. And yet I wasn't doing what every Christian is supposed to do, live a life of faith. And so God, uh, through a series of circumstances, led our family up to New England and uh, to partner with Pastor Schmidt and, and be a part. And as he mentioned, I have Titus here. And uh, Titus, will you come up here for a second? Uh, this is my oldest boy. He is about to turn seven, which is crazy to me. Uh, I've got another boy at home, Micah, and he is uh, almost five. And then uh, I have a little girl, Alana, one and a half, and uh, and just loving figuring out uh, a life with them and, and uh, my wife, Darcy. Um, I called him up here because how many of you are dads? Okay. All right. Almost everybody here. I, I, I think you'll understand this, but I'll, I'll say this. I only get one shot with him. I only get one shot with Micah, with Alana, and you only get one shot with your kid. And so I pray that times like this will help us grow in our ability to lead our families so that the next generation carries not just the faith, but lives a life, all that God intended it to be, lives a life fulfilling God's will because the example that you and I set for them. Because of the word of God that we teach them. So uh, thank you, Titus. You can sit down. Um, and so I pray that during this time that that will be the case. Uh, can I ask how many of you men are single? How many of you men are single? Okay. All right. And so the rest, I assume, are married. Uh, how many of you are in the military? All right. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll never understand what you go through to protect our freedoms and to allow us to enjoy the, the life that we live. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to get a little comfortable and understand exactly who I'm preaching to tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into this. I want you to take your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter number one. Genesis chapter number one. 
Tonight, as we jump into God's word, I, I really just, God has been steering me back to this. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I right even before we started, I grabbed a, another message out and it was like God just kept steering me back to this again in Genesis chapter one. And so I want to um, really just share a truth that whether you are four years old or 80 years old can change the way you live your Christian life. Uh, the, I, I've titled the message, Good Question. Good Question. One question that if we can really solidify the answer in our lives will change the way we think. In fact, I, I'd say it this way. If we can get the answer to this question right in our hearts, not just with our minds, not just with our mouths, but in our soul, in our, in our actual life, we'll remove the doubts we have about our walk with God. We'll remove the doubts we have about God's will or God's way. And I want to start in Genesis chapter one, because I want to lay some groundwork here, some things for us to understand. Genesis chapter number one. Uh, let's look at uh, verse number nine first. We're going to fly through these real quick uh, because I want you to see this, but uh, Genesis chapter one is creation. Uh, it's, it's the story of the, of the beginning. And in verse number nine, it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. By the way, that's a quick just throw out there, but stop and think about that. I mean, God just said, hey, let's, let's, make some, let's make some land. It was there. All right, we, have, we serve an amazing God. And we're going to talk about that in just a second, but I want you to see this. Verse number 10, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together the waters called he seas. And God saw that it, and what was those next three words? It was good. All right, jump down to verse number 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. It was good. All right, you guys are getting the hang of this. Verse number 18. Uh, in fact, let's start at 17. And God set them in the firmament of the, of the heaven to give light upon the earth. He's talking about light and darkness, stars, all these things. Verse number 18, and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. It was good. Verse 21, and God created great whales and every living creature that moved, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. It was good. Stay with me. Here we go. 25. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And verse number 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And I want to start there because I want to show something to you that's really important for us to understand. At the beginning, everything God made was good. Okay, I think you guys got that by now, okay? Everything he made, he, con he concluded by saying it was good. But then we see that God created man, and when he created man, he said, Look, I've made everything good, I've made everything right, everything is perfect, and I'm giving it to you. It's yours to, to take care of, to use, to enjoy, but I'm giving it all to you and it's all good. And he concludes this whole thing by saying it was very good. Tonight, I have a question for you. Is God good? Now, we all say it. In fact, many of us probably have, have been to a part of church. Maybe Pastor Ludka does this. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. We hear it. We say it. Praise the Lord. God's good. Do you believe it, though? Do you believe it, though? Because we're going to look at in just a second, chapter two and three, all of a sudden this story goes from a fairy tale. This I don't mean like it's not true. I mean, it's perfect in every way. It's exactly the way it should be. And all of a sudden it rapidly declines. So tonight I want to ask you the one question that could change the way you live. And that is, is 
God good? And maybe I could add this to the end. Is God good really? Genesis chapter number two, we go on to see in, uh, in verse number eight, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So inside this perfect world God has made, he made this garden, the Garden of Eden, and then it says he put man in that garden to enjoy, to dress, to keep it, and all these things. By the way, that tells us another thing about God. Not only is he creator, but he also expected us to work. Work was not a punishment of sin. Men, God designed us to be hard workers. Work was there before sin ever existed. And as men, no matter how old you are, you, you little guys up front, all of us in here, we should be hard workers because that is one of the ways God designed men to bring glory to God. And so we see here that God planted man in this garden. In this garden, there's two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and then we see in, uh, let's see, verse number... Lost my spot. Um, verse number 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I'll make him and help me for him. And then the best part of the story, God invented woman, right? But then we jump to chapter number three. Now, this is really what I want us to see tonight. Now we see God made everything good. He put man in the garden to enjoy everything good he made. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. By the way, that's not what God said. God said, Don't eat of it. He didn't say anything about don't touch it. And we, and maybe he did. We don't know. But from God's word, we know at least here that Satan, as the subtle creature he was here, began to put something in Eve's heart and mind, and that was a doubt. And here's the doubt. God's holding out on you. There's something not good about God. Let's look at what, it, what happens here. Verse number four, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. I know we've read a lot, and we're going to look at some more in just a minute. Why don't we have a word of prayer one more time? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come together now at this moment when we start jumping into your word here, God, would you make it come alive in our hearts? Would you help it to come alive in our minds? God, would you allow us to set aside the distractions? Would you allow us to set aside the, the things that would pull us away from your word piercing our hearts? God, would you allow me in this, this time to be empty of self, to, to be filled with your spirit? God, I pray that Lord, beyond me, uh, anything that I have to say that your word would be elevated and that your goodness would be elevated. Lord, if we leave after being here a couple days, Lord, with a better understanding of how good you are, Lord, I truly believe it could change our walk. And so, God, I pray and ask that something we get from your word tonight will help us as men to grow. And Lord, I ask this in your name. Amen. The greatest question you could ask to stop questioning everything else about God is this question, is God good? This story reveals a couple things that are, are really important on an apologetic level as well as a practical living out your faith level. We know that God is good because the definition of everything he started with at creation was that it was good. 
We know that God is good because we could probably spend the rest of the night going through all the passages in the Word of God that God reveals Himself as a good Father, a good Shepherd, a good God. And yet in all of our lives, we tend to struggle with temptation. We, te we tend to struggle in trials to believe that God is not punishing us or, or doing some evil thing against us. And what ultimately is at the foundation of those temptations that we fail and the times and trials where we feel like God hates us or he's mad at us or he's punishing us is this belief that God is good. Because see, in this story, we have Adam and Eve who had everything perfect. God created everything good and then gave it to Adam and Eve. Said, look, I want to give you good. And even with a perfect world and perfectly good things, they still believed a lie that God was not good. And when you and I in our lives go about our day-to-day -day activities and are struggling with temptation and struggle with sin and struggle with understanding trials, what ultimately is at the bottom of that is that we wonder, is God really good? Now, we can all say God is good. We can all say all the time and all the time God is good. But if you're like me, there have been many times in my life where I think God is really good, just not right now. God is really good to them. God is really good, but this doesn't seem like a good idea. God is really good, but I think this law, this guideline, this principle from God's word isn't. And tonight, if we can walk away understanding how good God is, we'll never be perfect. We're still going to struggle with sin. We're still going to struggle in trials. But the Christian life, you and I are left on this earth from the, the day we accept Christ as Savior to the day that he takes us home. The process in our life of becoming like Christ, we call it's a big word, we call it sanctification, okay? But here's the point. From the day we get saved to the day we die, God wants to work in us to use us to reach others. God wants to work in us to change us to be more like him. And at the foundation is an understanding that God is good. And so tonight from this passage here in Genesis chapter 3, I just want to point out some truths that if God is good, then we can do something different in our lives. And I'm going to, I'm going to point those out to you. But I want us to think about this question. And so tonight I want to give you three things that if God is good, it means this. And I'm, here's the first one. If God is good, I can trust him with his guidance. If God is good, I can trust him with his guidance. You know, I think of the teenagers in here and the young people. Um, I, I, I think of uh, military. We have a few military in our church, and oftentimes we, you know, are praying with them as they're praying about what that next step is going to be, the next station, the next place they're sent. And I think about our teenagers who so often have this struggle of my will versus God's will. And, you know, I became an adult and I, I was a teenager and then I worked with teenagers and I worked with kids. You know what I realized? It really doesn't matter what age you are. Sometimes you struggle with this idea of God's will versus my will. I think I know what's going to be best for my family. I think I know what's going to be the best choice for my job. I think I know what's going to be best for the, the house we live in or the place we choose to move to. And, and then there's this other thing that's in our mind that we feel like, well, maybe God wants us to stay or maybe God wants us to change or maybe God wants us to do this different. And when it comes to God's will at the core of that struggle is, is God good? And so tonight, if God is good, then we can trust him with his guidance. Look with me in chapter two, verse number 16. Verse number 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Okay? Now, let me get, tell you what that is right there. That's guidance. That's guidance, okay? God has proven himself to be a good God. He's given them all good things. And now in this moment, which by the way, God doesn't just give good. He also loves us and blessed us enough to also give us choice. And if you have choice and you have good, the byproduct of choosing something other than God's goodness is evil. And we'll jump into that a little bit deeper in a second, but I, I want you to understand this. God loves us enough he gave us choice. He loves us enough he gave us good. And so in this moment, God says, listen, if, if, if you trust me, I want you to listen to my guidance. It will lead you away from death. 
Why can we trust him if he's good with his guidance? Number one, I wrote down, he's our creator. He's our creator. We just read in chapter one that God created man. Uh, many of you in here, uh, well, all of you in here probably work different types of jobs. Some of you create things. Maybe you're a carpenter. Maybe you build homes or you build buildings. Or we, I know Paul here, a friend of mine who came from our church, he's an electrician. He's done a great job helping us at our church get all the electrical right. He builds things. My son here loves to play with Play-Doh. He makes things. You know who knows what that thing he makes is best? He does. Uh, dads in here would understand this, you know, Titus or Micah, they'll make something with Play-Doh that I go, Dad, look. And I go, oh, that's an amazing alligator. That's not an alligator, Dad. Oh, it's a house. It's a beautiful house, you know. <laughs> I can't argue with him. He's the creator. He knows what he was trying to make. You know, in our lives, we have the creator God who knows how your life works best. He knows how my life works best because he made us. He knows how we tick. He knows what will make us happy. He knows what will disappoint us. He knows how to make our lives work. And if he's a good God and a God who's proven himself to be good, then we can trust him with our guidance because no one knows how to make us work best besides God. It's very, very foolish as a creation to think I know better how to make me function right. And yet so many times in my life, I have believed that I know me better than my creator does. And so if God is good, I can trust him with his guidance because he's our creator. But secondly, he's our guide. He's our guide. In verse number 16 here, like I said, we see this guidance. He wants to give us direction. In fact, he gave us this thing right here. He gave us his word, a supernatural book that right now we can use to, to teach. And no matter what age we are in here, we can learn from it because God's word is his light to us. Bible tells us in Psalms, thy word or the um uh his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's an interesting way to phrase that. A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He knows exactly where I'm at and he knows exactly where he wants to send us. And in our lives, we have his presence, we have the Holy Spirit within us, we have the word of God. We he's given us every way to guide our lives. But we won't follow that if we don't believe. He's good. And so that question, as simple as it may be, is very, very deep at the core of our Christian walk. If God is good, I can trust him with his guidance. If he's good, I can trust him with the fact he's my creator. Thirdly, I want you to see he's your friend. He's your friend. I, I want you to stop and think about this for a second. God is my creator. He wants to personally guide me. Of all the things he's made, of all the Genesis chapter one, we kind of flew through it, but the, the sun and the moon and the stars and all of creation and all of these things that he's made, he's given us all this and yet he found it important to guide you and to guide me. So he's my creator, he wants to guide me, but deeper than that, he wants to be my friend. I mean, what is that? There's, by the way, there's no other religion that teaches a God that wants to be your personal friend. There's nothing else besides the word of God and the story of Jesus Christ and the redemption that he brings that gives us the opportunity to be friend with creator God. And in this story, we find in Genesis chapter two and three, that God had a personal interest in Adam and Eve, spent time with them to some degree. They, they knew his voice. They knew him. And, and here he wants to reveal to, his, to them his goodness by giving them good things. And so we see he's creator. We see he's guide. We see he's friend. Friend, can I tell you, if God is good, you can trust his guidance in your life. And each and every one of us in here, if, if you're a Christian, you know Jesus Christ as Savior. There is always, always something God is leading us to do or be a part of or get involved in. The Bible tells us whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so what that means is that in our lives, there are always steps of faith that God is calling us to take. Maybe there's men in here who are newly saved and it's the idea of getting baptized. Maybe there's men here who it's it's 
figuring out how to lead your family. And I, I, over the next couple of days, I, I pray that God will allow us to maybe take away some steps to help us lead our families. But in every area of our lives, God wants us to take steps of faith. And so God's guidance, if he's good, is something that we can trust. And by the way, you and I don't know what's going to happen tonight. A perfect evidence of that is we all looked at the forecast and expected this torrential downpour that should have started about an hour ago. We cannot guarantee what's going to happen two minutes from now. And yet so often in our lives, what God wired in us to lead and to be passionate about owning and and taking the, the control of, we use to try to take control of our lives. We use to try to think that as the creation, we know what to do. And so if God is good, I can trust him with his guidance. But secondly, I want you to see the second thing we see in the story. If God is good, I can trust him with my brokenness. If God is good, I can trust him with my brokenness. I don't think any of us in here have to be reminded of the fact that we are messed up. (laughs) We all are flawed. Uh, some of us in here physically are flawed. We've got, you know, every morning we wake up, there's something that doesn't work as good as it did the day before. I'm finally starting to get to that age where I'm discovering that. And it's disappointing. I'm getting to that place where I was better at everything than I actually was, you know, in my mind. And and now I can't do anything. So I have to talk about how good I was. Um, Many of us in here have had uh, emotional experiences in our lives that have broken us in different ways. Uh, Physical experiences. We're flawed. We're broken creatures. In this story, Adam and Eve did exactly what we would have done. They blew it. The one chance to live a perfect life with a perfect spouse in a perfect place for all of time was ruined in one moment. They were broken people. And can I tell you that if God is good, we can trust his guidance, but because we're flawed, because we're sinful, because we're not perfect, God is still good when we're broken. God is still a good God when we're broken. Look at uh, chapter three, verse number 10. This is after they ate of the fruit and uh, Satan had deceived them and and they willingly ate the fruit, verse number 10. And and, let's start in verse number nine. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? Now, by the way, God doesn't ask a question because he doesn't know the answer, okay? God's asking the question because he wants us to think about the answer. Verse number 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. By the way, there's a whole lot of implications there. Men, we're supposed to take ownership of our families. I just, I'll just say that. As the spiritual leaders of our home, we got to take ownership for that. Verse number 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. We really have a problem with blaming others, don't we? Uh, we'll jump into verse number 14 in just a second, but here's a couple of things I wrote down. If God is good, I can trust him with my brokenness. Why? Because he knows our flaws. He knows our flaws. Back to that idea that he's our creator. He also understands sin's power, evil's power, the destruction we have put upon ourselves and our lives and sin puts on our lives. Back to what I was talking about, uh, rewind just a little bit. But, uh, I, you know, I, I have people ask oftentimes, did God create good and evil? Or uh, how could God create evil? Or why would he put that tree there so this whole problem happened to begin with? I want to explain this, okay? God created good. He made all things good. The definition of evil is anything deteriorating from God's original design, okay? Um, Evil is anything that veers or goes off course in the way God originally designed it. You say, well, how do you know that? Because Genesis chapter 1 and 2 tells us that everything was good. God had created everything. It was good. And it wasn't until our free choice impacted it that evil existed. And so God creates good and he creates choice. And the reason God put that tree in there, why I can't speak to exactly why he put the tree in the garden of Eden. I know this, God has always, always given us choice because he loves us and wants us to choose him by choice, not obligation. 
He wants us to choose to love him. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing. But there, there's some implications to that in your life and my life. Uh, can I tell you this from this passage? There's a couple of things we can learn about sin. First of all, you and I always have a choice. We're all men in here. There are plenty of temptations out there. There are plenty of temptations on that computer and at the workplace and even at home. There are temptations all around us. Can I tell you this? You always have a choice. Men, let's not play the victim to our temptations. We have a choice. God promises us in his word that with every temptation, there's also a way of escape. You know what the problem is, though, is we like the gamble. I'm, I'm doing discipleship right now with a... Um, uh, with a, a guy who just got out of the military and uh, saw a lot of action overseas and lives an incredibly disciplined life. But in the area of his spiritual life, he's discovering he just is kind of anything goes. And he's made so many choices in his life and he knows they're bad and he's discovering now that God's word is revealing ways he should live. And you know what he's finding? It's a whole lot harder to be disciplined in temptation and in your spiritual life than it ever was in action. Guys, I just want to say that one thing that jumps out to me at this is that all of us have a choice. And we're going to talk more about that probably tomorrow morning. But uh, what I want to get at here is that God is good. And we are flawed. And God is so good, he loves us when we're flawed. It's an amazing thing to be able to have a friend who knows all the things that's wrong with us and love us anyways. Many of you who are married here understand this principle. Um, I, I am amazed that my wife loves me. She knows all the things that I do wrong. She knows all the times that I haven't been a good husband or haven't been a good father or, or should have done things better or should have shown love in a greater way, and yet she loves me anyways. And by the way, marriages are supposed to picture our relationship with God. And so we see here that if God is good, I can trust him with my brokenness. He knows our flaws, and he likes us anyways. I wrote that down right right there. He likes us anyways. The second thing I wrote down, he knows our fears. Not just our flaws, he knows our fears. Verse number 10 there in chapter 3, Adam said, I was afraid. Adam at this point was at least honest enough to tell him what was going on. And he was afraid because he heard the voice, which means he experienced guilt for the first time in his life. He knew he had done something against a good God. He had given up what was good for what he believed to be good. And here in this passage, it tells us he was afraid. And, and I wrote down, God loves us in spite of that. He loves us in spite of our flaws. He loves us in spite of our fear. And by the way, there's a lot of stories in God's word where people were afraid, where men were afraid. I think of Moses who gave God all these excuses. And yet God continued to show him and be patiently revealed to him that he was with him. And in this passage, we see the same thing. And so whether you have flaws, which we all do, or you have fears, can I tell you this, following a good God, he's okay with that, and he'll guide you out of that. He knows our flaws. He knows our fears. Thirdly, he knows our enemy. He doesn't just know us. He knows all the things that are fighting against us. In verse number 15, or excuse me, 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Verse number 15, And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise, or, uh, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Can I tell you what that is? That's a prophetical verse that's pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ one day was going to conquer death. You know, what's an amazing thing about our good God is not just that he knows our flaws and knows our fears, but he also knows our enemy. I'll tell you what, I want to be guided by somebody who doesn't just know me, but knows what's out there. I'll tell you, as a dad, that's what I want to be for him. I want to love him in spite of his flaws and in spite of his fears. And I also want to love him enough to know what's going to hurt him. I want to, I want to be able to guide him through his life so that he doesn't maybe experience some of the same hurts or, or temptations or struggles that I experience. I want to be able to know how to guide him through life. The Bible tells us that Solomon said, or David said, my son, give me thine heart. And you know what? In our lives, men, we have a heavenly father who says, listen, I want you to know that in spite of your flaws, in spite of your fears, I want to guide you. And by the way, I know where that enemy is. 
And so we see if God is good, I can trust him with my brokenness. And lastly, the third one I wrote down, if God is good, I can trust him with his protection. If God is good, I can trust him with his protection. So I'll rewind a little bit here. If God is good, and we all said he was, if God's good, then why don't you trust him with his guidance? Why don't I trust him with his guidance? If God is good, I can trust him with my brokenness. He wants to lead my life, but he also knows exactly who I am and where I am and is okay with loving me anyways. We see that in the fact that the Bible talks about Adam and Eve being naked. Okay, it wasn't just a physical thing. It was the fact that they were exposed in every way. They had no way to hide themselves. And here God comes to them because he knew they wouldn't come to him. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel that all of our brokenness and all of our sin, there's no way we can hide that from an all-knowing God. And yet in spite of that, he still sent his son to die for us and to save us. And so we see that. And then thirdly, we see if God is good, I can trust him with his protection. Verse number, chapter three, verse number 21. We hadn't got this far yet. After talking to Adam and Eve about what the consequences of their choices were going to be, which by the way, God doesn't necessarily punish us, but he does allow consequences to take place. He does allow the natural consequences of our choices to play out. And, and I want you to see here in what we're going to read that God protects us from future hurt. In verse number 21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Um, therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man. And he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. This is something that I think is important for us to understand, too, is that God wants to protect us because he's good. The Bible talks about in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, right? It talks about thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He leadeth me beside still waters. In this passage, we see that, yes, God had to remove them from the garden, but it wasn't because he hated them. It wasn't because he was getting back at them. God had to remove them from the garden because there was another tree there that we read about in chapter two, the tree of life. And this verse in uh, verse number 22 reveals to us that if they took of that tree, they would have lived in a sinful state for eternity. And so to protect them from further hurt, protect them from another temptation that would infinitely ruined their life he removed them from the garden and put a cherubim a, a a type of angel with a flaming sword to guard that garden so they can never come back in by the way this is a picture of the gospel but can i tell you this that if god is good he wants to guide you if god is good he's okay with your brokenness and can lead us out of that brokenness but thirdly if god is good he wants to protect us and in this story i see two things he did to protect us number one he clothed us in restoration he clothed us in restoration. Look, Adam and Eve, they now knew good and evil. They now knew what guilt felt like. They now were going to experience what death felt like. They were going to experience things as God never wanted them to be. And so he covered them. He covered them. He clothed us in restoration. And this is the gospel. In this story, their brokenness, they could never save themselves from the problem. And so God covered them in this temporarily. But when Jesus Christ came and shed his blood to cover our sins, he fulfilled the eternal promise to save us. And so we see he clothed us in restoration. But then secondly, we see he guards us from destruction. So he clothed us in restoration. But secondly, he guards us from destruction. And I just, I just want to point out here, this isn't about hating us. So let me back up a little bit here and, and we're going to finish this. When you're tempted, when you're struggling with doing what you believe God wants you to do, when you hear Pastor Ludcon Sunday morning or you hear your Sunday school teacher, or you hear different people speak about what God is calling you to do or what God's word says and, and you have this thought, that seems archaic. That seems like it wouldn't work in my situation. I, I know that we're supposed to obey the Bible, but I think this will work better. Here is what's at the core of that. 
Is God good? Is God's are God's principles in his word timeless and truthful for you and I today? Absolutely. And the reason God gives us guidelines and the reason God gives us direction and the reason God gives us the ability to know where he wants us to go is because he is good. And so when we're struggling with temptation, what we're really struggling with is God good. When we're struggling in a trial to understand what God is doing and what am I supposed to do and, and is God mad at me and does he hate me and is, is there something that he's like punishing me for? Can I remind you that God is good? Whether it's a trial or it's a temptation or whether it's a direction in your life or you're trying to understand what God is doing, if you believe God is good, it will clarify what God can do. Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good to them that love God. I feel like sometimes that phrase gets missed. I hear people oftentimes going through trials, well, God works all things together for good. Yes, that is absolutely true. But to them that love God. You know why I believe that's there? I believe it's because as we learn to love God and we get to know him and we draw up close to him in our lives, we discover how good he is. But when we go through trials and we're constantly wondering if God's angry at us or mad at us or what's happening, we miss how God is maybe trying to reveal how he's still good, even in the evil, even in the bad times, even when sin impacts our world, when there's health problems and when there's difficulties and, and financial struggles and all those kinds of things. Can I tell you, friend, that God can still be good and wants to still be good? And those temptations, sometimes what would give us the greatest victory is to stop and go, whoa, 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 I don't need to look at this. I don't need to do that. I don't need to trust myself because God says he's good. And so even though I don't understand how this is going to work and I don't understand how that's better to do it God's way than my way, I'm going to give it a try. And one of the earliest ways we figure this out as Christians is to those of us who have learned to trust God in our giving. You know, to give a part of our income to God when we know he has it all and we know that he controls it all, but to give a part of it to him and find that God can do more with our less than we could ever do with all of ours is one of the first ways we discover that God can't be good, that God is good. And so men, boys, all of us here tonight, I just want to start these next couple of days with this thought. Is God good in your life? Like, do you really believe that God is good? It will give you the ability to conquer temptation. It will give you the ability to navigate through trials. It will give you the ability to know what those steps of faith you need to take are and take those steps of faith because you know God is good. And so I, I know this is probably a, a simple thought, but I tell you, in my own life, it's really, really hard sometimes. It's hard to live trusting God by faith that he is good. The crazy thing is, he's never not been good. He's never not come through. And so maybe we could take a lesson from Adam and Eve's playbook tonight. They had everything perfect and everything right. They still struggled with this. And here's where Satan got them. Are you sure God is good? That's our word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, right off the bat, we see that you love us. And we see that you are good. God, we could ask that question a hundred times tonight. And, and yet, Lord, in our lives, it will be the next temptation. It'll be the next choice. It'll be the next trial. It'll be the next step of faith you call us to that we really answer that. If we really believe that you're good, then we'll trust your way. We'll trust your word. We'll trust your direction. We'll trust you by faith. And God, I pray that, Lord, our time up here results in us becoming more real, becoming men who lead, that we become men and, and young men who own the ability to walk with you. God, you've called us priests. You've called us your friend. You've given us the ability to have an interaction and a conversation and to walk with you. And God, I pray that we would make our walk with you real so that we see how good you are. God, I pray that, Lord, in our lives, 
will discover this. That the next thing we go through, we'll choose to trust that you're good. We'll choose to trust that your way is right. And not just have victory over sin or not just get through the trial, but come out of the other side of that being in awe. Thank you, Lord, for coming to save us. Thank you for being a creator who cares so much about a creation. We'll never understand that on this side of heaven. But God, I pray that with whatever time we have here on earth, we will learn to see you in every area of our lives. Lord, I ask this in your holy and precious name. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Ludka.